somewhat entertaining. Um, PGY4 Grand Rounds is a time for uh, PGY4 to discuss the a case, an experience, a challenge, anything that was meaningful uh, throughout their four years here. Um, many people were very disappointed to learn this is not an ultrasound talk. Uh, for, for those who ever went to a morning report by me, I've done seven morning reports and every one of them has been an ultrasound diagnosis. So like, chill out. Um, I, I thought about a lot of things to do for this talk. Um, I thought about a, the first sales innovation I had as a PGY2 and watching a team full of seniors and nurses and attendings stare at me as I tube the goose. Uh, I thought about a really bad A side shift in Brooklyn where I pronounced or I coded a, a wife and then her husband in the same room two days later and had to tell that to the children. I thought about how COVID uh, has shifted the way we practice medicine and, and how medicine looks like in our departments um, between my first year and my fourth year now. And then I realized, going next slide, that I was thinking about this at four o'clock in the morning and I had just worked two overnight shifts and I had to work a eight o'clock shift in, in two hours and that I'd been thinking about doing grand rounds in my bed and not sleeping. And I was suffering from a shift work sleep disorder, which is very common amongst those who work night shifts. Um, and I would say one of the biggest challenges for me personally um, during residency has been dealing with nights. Um, and so I decided to dedicate my grand rounds to, to night shifts. So uh, today I'll talk about a evidence-based approach to optimizing alertness and sleep during night shifts in emergency medicine. Uh, we'll go over some of the literature behind sleep disorders, but particularly some studies done in EM over the last few years. Um, we'll talk about kind of the twofold aspects of preparing. One, how to make a good schedule for it. And two, once you made your schedule, how to have a good routine for it. Um, and because it's, it's PGY4 grand rounds, I also have some non-evidence-based rants. Um, <laughs> So, so a, a little bit about myself and, and my kind of obscure relationship with nights. Uh, I grew up in the town of Norwich, Connecticut. Next slide. Um, which is right here. If you look at the bottom of the map, it's New York on the bottom and Boston on top. Um, Norwich used to be a very wealthy uh, um, textile town back in the 1800s. Um, but with kind of the loss of the cotton trade in the U.S. Uh, for about 150 years, it was very, very poor. Then in 19... 96, uh, the Pequot tribe, uh, which is one town over from mine, and the Mohegan tribe, which is in my town, Norwich, uh, made a deal with uh, the Connecticut government to open up two casinos, uh, Mohegan Sun being the one in my town. Uh, at the time in 2000, when it, started, when it was at peak, it was the largest casino in the United States uh, by gaming floor volume, uh, bigger than any casino in Las Vegas. So I grew up in a casino town. Um, casinos have one similarity to emergency departments in that they are staffed 24-7. Um, my mom worked at the casino uh, in Keno. And so between the ages of 13 to 21, I lived with a shift worker, right? Um, my mom worked every Thanksgiving. She worked every Christmas. And she worked many of the nights. Uh, most of the friends I had growing up in Norwich, their parents worked at a casino. Right? It was very regular for us to go over my friend's house. And we had to be dead silent until 6 p.m. because their parents were sleeping in. The parents would wake up, eat dinner with us, leave at 8 p.m., and then we'd be home alone for all the night because no one was home. Right? Um, when I was, uh, next slide, 18, I got a job myself at the casino. <laughs> um, I, I worked in the, um, uh, the arena as an usher and security. Um, and so there would be shows that come on Saturdays starting at 8 o'clock. Um, the band probably wouldn't leave and pack until 3 a.m. I would have to wait until everyone left, so I would leave at 4 a.m. and get home around 5 a.m. Um, so I, I worked a lot of overnights, even at a very young age. Uh, then I went to UConn. Um, uh, Rob's not here. Uh, but, but this is Tom Regan. He was our EM culture director at UConn. He was my mentor. And he said, you know, 
he, he gave this speech every year about how great EM was. And he talked about, you know, the flexibility, the procedures, the variety of care, everything. Um, but he said, if you want to work in EM, you got to be okay working nights. And that was his, his main, like, um, statement. He said, if you, you know, you sometimes have to work holidays, you sometimes have to work weekends, but you have to be okay working nights. That is the one agreement of EM. Um, he's been working clinically for about 30 years. And when I graduated, he actually exited out of nights completely. Uh, he got a job as the Dean of Admissions at UConn uh, in the right picture here. Um, so he basically only works one day shifts uh, a week. And I, I initially didn't think much of it because as a 25 year old med student, I flipped days, nights, days, nights, days, nights without problem. Um, but over these last four years, it started to catch up on me. Uh, so let's talk about the problem itself. Let's, let's look at these, uh, this list of chief complaints. Um, what do they have all in common? Uh, no, that's not what your team, bo team two board looks like right now. Uh, Willie, next slide. This is, uh, these are all conditions uh, associated with shift work uh, throughout the literature. Um, some of these associations are not very strong, anywhere from 3 to 20% increased risk. Uh, but they are very validated. Um, again, not causative, just associated. There is, a, there is a possibility that people with diabetes just choose to work overnight. Um, but next slide. <laughs> uh, but this is a twofold problem, right? One, we are trying to work when our bodies don't like working. Uh, this is an EM specific study uh, by Harrison, uh, actually not too long ago, where they had in an academic emergency department, uh, residents and attendings rate how alert they were at various shifts throughout the night. Um, so the top graph on the right is how subjective they felt. And in the blue line, you can see it's a night shift. And at 7 a.m. On, on a night shift is when people feel the crappiest. They also have made them do like reflex games on an iPad throughout the night. This is for multiple shifts. And that is the graph down here below. As you can see, people perform. Their brain is the groggiest 7 a.m. on a night shift, right? This is what we expect. Uh, the flip side of the coin is, Willie, uh, that we're not sleeping well on night shifts as well. Um, or we're not sleeping well in the day. Uh, so the Ferguson group looked at another academic department, residents and attendings, they gave each of them a sleep tracker, like on the wrist to wear for three months. Sleep that was initiated during regular nighttime, people got about seven hours of sleep, as you expect. Sleep that started in the daytime, people averaged only 5.3 hours, 25% decrease, right? This is amongst residents and attendants. So we're working when we're not supposed to, we're sleeping when we're not supposed to, but somehow we still go to work and we do a decent job. Um, the Silbergate group looked at a, another academic department um, looking for differences in key physician tasks between differences between daytime and nighttime. They looked at bounce backs, the rates of aspirin administration and cath lab activation for MIs, and first pass success on intubation. Among three years and over 300 thousand visits, they could not find a difference between day and night, right? So even though we are tired, we're still doing a decent job at night. Um, next slide. But somehow over time, this adds up to us. This is not a fun place to be, right? Uh, the Smith Group uh, surveyed about 800 attendings in the United States, and it said, how do you feel about night shifts? Almost half of them said, that night shifts made them want to leave emergency, part, emergency medicine in general. Um, and we know this is a bigger problem for physicians as they become older, right? It become harder to adjust days and nights. Uh, the Goldberg asked 1,000 EM attendings uh, registered in ASEP over the age of 55, which was what they consider their pre-retirement years. How do you feel about night shifts? And almost 75% of them felt that they were concerned that they were unable to flip back and forth between nights and days. To put that in perspective, this same group of people, Willie, um, only less than a third of them were even concerned about their long and short-term memory. Less than half of them were concerned about the volume of patients on shift. Right? These, are, these are attendings nearing retirement. They can do the job just fine. They just can't do it at night. Um, so, so ASEP has devised a kind of a general policy statement 
for how we should be dealing with night shifts. Uh, first of all, they recommend either isolated night shifts or relatively long sequence, which is a broad range. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, they ask that shifts be 12 hours or less. Again, these are, these are for all physicians, residents, attendings, academic community, everybody. Um, they ask that shifts be pushed in a clockwise manner. Um, so day is going to evening is going to night. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, they ask for anchor sleep periods or periods of sleep where we are always asleep, whether we're days or nights. Um, they ask for incentives uh, for those working nights as well. Um, they also go a little bit into depth about uh, driving hazards and having a place to sleep, but unfortunately we're not a big driving residency or uh, department, so we kind of skim over that. Uh, and finally, they talk about factoring the physician's age as a fact um, of night shift. Um, basically asking that uh, physicians of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, physicians in, in later age also be able to kind of uh, be um, moved out of night shift. Um, so we'll talk about these in depth. Um, the first part I want you to think about is planning night shift. Uh, so for all my juniors in the class, uh, block 7A schedules are out. How do you answer these questions? Uh, or for, for my up and coming attendings, how do you think about bulking? How do you think about putting your night shift together? Um, so next slide. Uh, the first concept I want to talk about is this clockwise manner of shift rotation, right? That is doing some days, then doing some evenings, then doing some nights. It's much easier for a circadian rhythm to be delayed a few hours back than it is to advance a few hours forward. And this is the same reason why it's always easier to fly west than it is flying east. Um, they've actually studied this not in EM physicians, but in inpatient nurses. When you move their schedules clockwise, they get better sleep, they do better on the job. When you do it counterclockwise, uh, they get much less sleep and they get much groggier on the job. Uh, the issue with this is in order to have clock rotations, you either have to have shorter shifts or you have a more variety of shifts, uh, i.e. more swing shifts. Um, this is not, unfortunately, compatible with your 8 to 8, 12-hour uh, shifts because um, there's just too much of a stark transition. Uh, for the juniors who are concerned that they are being outed and we are ruining their nights, just know 12-hour shifts are not a norm for just juniors. If you uh, that same Smith study where they interviewed uh, nationally EM attendings, upwards of a third of attendings around the U.S. were 12-hour shifts. Um, in, the same, in a different study, uh, this is back in 2015, Willie, really, um, the STO uh, looked at 82 EM programs in the United States, and they asked the uh, PDs, did they, do, your, um, do your residents work 12-hour shifts? Uh, of the PGY-4, so programs with four-year residencies, more than half of Fours across this nation work 12-hour shifts. Um, so we are, we are actually very lucky in that we don't work any 12-hour shifts at fourth year. Um, the other aspect of this is, yes, a lot of people work in 12, um, but a lot of juniors and residents actually don't want to work shorter shifts. Uh, if you look at, this is a uh, Rushall study, uh, 2018, where they interviewed 150 residents across the United States, uh, various three and four year programs, and they asked them, what kind of shifts do you want to work? Most residents actually preferred longer 10 hour shifts. The least desirable shifts are actually eights. Now they asked, you know, would you rather work more, more frequent eights or uh, less frequent six, um, 12? The issue is eights, shorter shifts are probably best for our night shifts. A lot of people aren't working them out of just how the nation is designed, and a lot of residents don't want to work them. Um, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, so the, the, the two kind of um, trains of thoughts on the, the best duration of shifts is either working isolated, one isolated night, and then going back to days, or doing a string of two to four. Uh, the advantage of the, the one is that there is some Extrapolated as says, if you just work one night shift, it does not shift your circadian rhythm enough that it will ruin your sleep for the next day. You can go, you can work one night and come back to usual. Um, two to four tends to be a little more convenient because you get to clump a little more nights together. 
just know that as you're working longer and longer shifts, you're accumulating more and more sleep debt. Um, and then there is some data, uh, this is in IM Resonance, that after about four to five night shifts, your cognitive performance actually starts to go down considerably, uh, partially because of the sleep debt. Um, ASAP doesn't have a great recommendation. Uh, some of our good uh, experts in the field also say somewhere in between is, is the balance. Find out what's best for you. One, but that means, again, you lose more days flipping back and forth. Or if you, want to, if you can handle it, try to do two to four. More than four is probably not good for you. Uh, again, the same Rashal study asked residents, how do you like your nights? Um, so the middle three are those that are highly recommended for good night shift transitions. Again, isolated nights, strings of two, strings of three. Um, unfortunately, these are actually the least popular choices among residents. Uh, residents actually preferred either a string of six nights, uh, which again is, is long. And, and we, don't, we don't do this, but some programs around the country do. Uh, and it is decently favored, which is surprising, is surprising to me, is that some residents actually prefer full blocks, full months of nights. Uh, which for many reasons uh, probably does not sound a good idea, particularly because there's data that shows even full on after two, three weeks of working nights, only a subset of the population actually switches their sleep, sleep cycle. The majority of people will just suffer in insomnia. Um, so the last, the last topic I want to talk about is anchor sleep. Um, this is the idea that there is a consistent amount of hours of the day your body is used to getting sleep. Anchor sleep tends to help you achieve higher levels of deeper sleep. Um, so let's say uh, in the top bar, uh, you're working a night and um, you're sleeping from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., right? That is, that is your daytime sleep. The next bar is, let's say you're off the next day, right? You can choose to sleep whenever you want. You purposely, instead of sleeping at a regular person's hour, you purposely stay up till 4 a.m. So you sleep 4 a.m. to noon, right? The reason you do that is because now you, that from the periods of 8 a.m. to noon, your body is asleep. So whether you're doing a night shift or you're doing your, you know, your day off, the idea is that having more overlap, by having a set standard of time that your body knows I will get some sleep then, you get to promote better sleep. Um, there is one enemy of anchor sleep, Willie, uh, and that is domas uh, or days off my ass. Having one day off between transitioning between nights and then going back to day. Uh, most people recommend that you at least need to have two days off after night to truly transition and get enough rest to adequately function on your day. Um, also, if you want to do anchor sleep, you can't sleep at 4 a.m. if you're working a day the next day, right? Um, so the, the one downside of trying to optimize good anchor sleep means avoiding domas. Um, and obviously, the, the, the downstream effect of that is you lose out on your free days off, right? You spend your day transitioning after your night instead of just taking one day and going back to days. Um, so those, those are the major points when it comes to planning out a schedule. Again, um, thank you to our wonderful schedulers here uh, for at least, uh, Damien's not here, but for, for the seniors, it's nice that we at least have a good circadian rhythm um, involved in our schedules. Um, for the juniors, again, tough to have circadian rhythm, but at least we give you the, sometimes the option of considering if a DOMA is something you want. Just know a DOMA is not supportive of good sleep health. Uh, let's talk about the actual preparation for a day or a night shift. Um, let's go, we're going into our first night. Um, first um, principle I want you to think about is hopefully, even if your shift, if your uh, schedule is not already created, try to optimize a clockwise manner, right? So if you're going days, 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 nights, try to on your last day, sleep a little bit later, wake up a little bit later, as if someone had moved you clockwise in that direction. Um, try to get a little bit of that anger sleep we talked about. Uh, try to have some good exercise 
daytime is the best time to have a good meal because you might not have a good meal that night. Um, and nap. There is great data that says not necessarily EM, but kind of in all fields, that napping for a night shift makes you cognitively much better. Uh, when to nap is a tough question. There's not good data that says uh, when the best naps are. So I asked our esteemed panelists of Nocturnus, when do they like to nap? Uh, the, the most common answers were one, either an early two to four or a five to eight. Um, a lot of our attendings like nap, doing a little bit of a workout, noonish to three-ish, and then napping that five to eight. Again, these are folks working, they start work at midnight, so may not be applicable for someone to start at eight. Uh, so you get on a shift, you're ready to go. Now you're feeling a little bit groggy, you're feeling a little bit sleepy. What are things we can do to optimize your performance? Uh, as you notice, thankfully, this the first part has been done for you. Bright lights in, at night, especially those with a little bit of a bluish tone, tend to keep us awake. Um, thankfully, both of our departments, or all of our departments, are very well lit with very well blue lights. So um, what is this chemical here? For anyone who took organic chemistry, organic chemistry lab. Who's that? Oh, all right, great. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, this is, this is caffeine. Um, Willie, next slide. There, there, you might have remember this little uh, equation where you have to make theobromide and make it into caffeine. Um, anyways, uh, there's, there's a plethora of studies that says caffeine keeps us more awake, especially at nighttime. We won't go into those in depth. Um, the, the question, let me go back. Um, but what I, what I want to think about, oh, uh, also the other thing is, um, this is a Richard study where they looked at a academic department and they asked attendings, residents, nurses, what do you do for night shift? This was just kind of an open-ended survey. Um, caffeine tend to be the most common stimulant. Upwards of uh, three quarters of nurses, residents, and attendings all use caffeine. This is the most popular stimulant among people working night shifts in the ED. Um, we all know how caffeine works. The question is, how do you dose your caffeine most optimally? Um, most people say the upper limit of good function is four milligrams of caffeine for every kilogram of body weight. Uh, so for a 70 kilogram individual, that would be, Willie, uh, about three shots of espresso, uh, six Diet Cokes, which is a Von My Heart special, or, or uh, two Red Bulls, which is a Snar Mini. Um, how, the second question is, when is the best time to take your caffeine, right? Take it too early, and you might lose out on the rest of your shift. Uh, take it too late, and it's going to be in your system, affecting your sleep the next morning. Which again, we're already getting bad sleep. Let's not ruin it with caffeine. Uh, caffeine for most people. Oh, wait, go back. Uh, so <laughs> you're like you're like skipping ahead. You're skipping ahead. All right. Caffeine has a has a half life. Really? Uh, sorry. Um, caffeine has a peak effect around 30 minutes uh, when ingested liquid. Uh, a little bit longer. Um, for the pills, uh, and it has a half-life around five hours. So uh, there's some debate on whether it's the first pass, second pass, uh, zero, zeroth order of metabolism. Uh, but assuming you take caffeine uh, at eight o'clock, you reach your kind of peak at around nine, and it kind of slowly growls down, hopefully to within under 20% of max uh, effect by the time you go to sleep. Uh, the only one issue with that is some people feel like at 3 a.m. you start to lose a little bit of your, your strength, and that's kind of when you need it the most. So my approach is, really next slide, uh, doing a kind of a half and half, getting half of it at the start of your shift, get that little early boost at 8 o'clock, and right as you dwindle down around noon is when you get your second half of your caffeine, boost up, stay strong around 4 a.m., and then even as you go to sleep at 9, it's still only around 25% of max concentration. Uh, so 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, half and half of your four makes per take uh, of caffeine is how I would do it. Um, just know that the metabolism gets a little trickier. Uh, the caffeine is broken down by the CYP1A2 uh, enzyme. There is polymorphism, depending on the study you read. About half of us are considered fast metabolizers, and these are people who drink like 1,000 coffees a day and don't get affected. And the other half of us are slow metabolizers. Uh, there are websites online that actually will do genetic testing to let you know what kind of metabolizer you are. Um, but beyond that, there are other things that affect our metabolism, Willie. Uh, 
beyond the polymorphism, anyone with bad liver disease, obviously your SIP system is not going to work well. You're going to have bad metabolism. Uh, people in third trimester pregnancy is also going to be slow metabolism of caffeine. There are some studies that say your half-life goes all the way up to 12 hours uh, in third trimester pr pregnancy. Those who take oral contraceptives and SSRIs, the two main common drugs that affect caffeine metabolism, they will also push your half-life a little bit later um, as well. Uh, finally, there is some new emerging uh, data on the effect of caffeine and uh, actually its effect on ruining your sleep. Uh, there are polymorphism in the adenosine A2A receptor as well. Uh, effectively, people who tend to be, uh, who have caffeine-induced anxiety, those who kind of get the shakes and anxious whenever they drink uh, caffeine, also tend to have much, much worse sleep when they take coffee. Um, they think there's a polymorphism. There's a couple of uh, nucleotide transitions that may be linked to both of those. It's a long way of saying, really, if drinking coffee makes you feel like this, I would avoid drinking it anywhere between eight, seven hours of sleep because it's going to ruin your sleep both for your night shifts and even your day shifts. Uh, now we talk about some emerging decent or uh, poor research, depending on how I want to look at it. Uh, there are some people that say hydrocortisone peaks in the daytime and gives us a little bit of energy. There are some people that theorize if you take hydrocortisone at night, it might give you a little bit extra of a boost. Uh, this is actually done in the EM setting. They looked at just four attendings, and they took a, this is a blinded study. They took 40 milligrams of hydrocortisone versus placebo, and then they asked the attendings blinded, how did the night shift go? Did you like it or did you not like it? Um, incredibly, this is actually great data. 81% uh, said they, uh, of the attendees who took hydrocortisone before a night shift said they enjoyed the night shift. And of the placebo, only 29% only said they enjoyed it. So uh, uh, this is multiple night shifts. They, they, uh, they basically did it for about like, they did it a month of, uh, they took either, uh, they were given a blind pill for a month. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's steroid psychosis or um, another another EM study is modafinil, which is, is, is actually approved for sleep wake disorder. Um, they basically got 25 attendings and residents uh, take uh, 200 milligrams of modafinil or placebo uh, again right before a night shift, and then they made them all go to a lecture in the daytime, like your morning port equivalent, and then they surveyed them after morning port. How did you feel? Uh, so, as you can see, the difficulty in attending lecture was much lower in modafinil. Uh, so, yeah, modafinil keeps you awake. This is eight hours after your night shift into the day. Um, but then none of them fell asleep. They all had difficulties falling asleep when they took modafinil. So, effectively, for me, at least, it's like having a coffee in the morning after your night shift. So, uh, still a little hot take. Okay. So, we talked about bright lights. We talked about early caffeination. Avoid caffeination later in the shift. Uh, now it's 4 a.m. and Tom walks up to you and says, I'm going to bread and butter. What would you like? Uh, what do you say? Um, so there's, again, not great data in EM, but you know, data in the nutritional world. Having heavier, carb-heavy meals tends to make us a little bit groggier. This is true in my shift as well. Um, most, uh, this is the same uh, Richard study where they asked EM attendings and uh, residents, how, will, how much do you eat? Uh, again, small study, but in this study, uh, some residents ate a full meal at night and some residents just ate nothing. Uh, this is unfortunately not great data to have performance value on. Uh, so again, I asked our esteemed nocturnists what they did uh, for their meals. Um, one nocturnist goes a little bit on the lighter side. Uh, they have a full meal, eight o'clock, regular dinner. Uh, they avoid coffee. They just drink black tea. And so midnight, they start going down on their 24 ounces of black tea. Uh, around 4 a.m., they go for a light salad. And 6 a.m., they go for a apple. So this is kind of a lighter side. Uh, this nocturnal said it made them keep their energy levels relatively balanced throughout the night shift. Um, a different nocturnal told me, I love to eat. Eating is what keeps me going on night shifts. I need a meal to keep me going. And so this is someone who eats full dinner at night and basically packs two additional dinners, one for, <laughs> one for midnight and one for 6 a.m. because uh, that's what it takes for them to work. Um, again, not great data one way or another, but pick what works best for you. Uh, finally, the best advice I got from kind of nocturnists, 
is that, not this one, um, is, that, <laughs> is that if you are working and it's groggy and it's 4 a.m., the last thing you want to do for staying awake is sitting at a desk staring at Epic, right? So if you can, if you have some downtime, get up, walk around, go see the other team, go see a patient, just get off the desk and keep moving, right? Because movement is going to keep you awake. Um, all right, what do we have? Okay, so you, you survived your first night shift, and now it is 8 o'clock in the morning. You gave sign out. What do you do? That's just half the battle. This is where good sleep hygiene comes in. Um, so your attending says, do you want to get brunch? And what do you say? Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if, you, if, you value, if you value good daytime sleep, you will say no. Um, this is already when you are pushed to the limits of your energy exhaustion. Uh, anything more, you're pushing on sleep debt, on sleep debt that you'll never recover over the next few days. Um, in addition, uh, while alcohol is a phenomenal beverage in the daytime, just know that it will ruin the amount of deep sleep and REM sleep that you have. Even if you sleep the same amount, you will have much less recovery in that duration of sleep. But it is fun. Um, okay, so, so uh, next. Bright lights, including the blue lights that we talked about that work on shift, also work against us in the daytime. Uh, they help, they unfortunately remind our circadian rhythm that it is daytime and makes it harder for us to sleep. Uh, you don't have to go crazy with these mountaineering glasses, but if it is a sunny day and you are going home, I would recommend some form of eye protection just to block some of the blue lights to remind our bodies hey, let's not wake up right now. Uh, good sleep hygiene that works at night is also applicable in daytime sleep, right? So sleep in a cool, dark, um, quiet environment. Blackout shades if you can. These are some of my, uh, so I, I'm not sponsored, but these are some of my favorite products that I use personally. Uh, Willie, I use the Emzu eye mask, which costs under 20 bucks. It is the best one. Uh, works better than any blackout curtain. Um, I have a gravity blanket, which helps me go to sleep and keeps me cool. And uh, I have a crying three-month-old across the wall from my apartment. And so sometimes when they cry, I use my uh, Sony XM4s to noise out or, or earplugs work. Um, so how, how do you sleep? Most people recommend sleeping you know, as soon as you get home, because that's probably when you're the most exhausted. Uh, but unfortunately, there's not great data on when the best sleep time for the daytime works. So again, I asked some of our attendings. Uh, a couple of our attendings are, or of our nocturnists actually do a, a two-part sleeper uh, where they sleep from 10 to 2. They wake up spontaneously, do some errands, and then nap again from 5 to 8 before going back to the night shift. Um, one attending does something a little unconventional. Uh, they actually find they sleep better after a run. And so they will leave night shift, go for a full-on exercise, wake themselves up, and then sleep again at 11 o'clock. But this allows them to sleep continuously from 11 to 7. Again, limited data on this, so take it for what, take it for what this is worth. Um, who knows what chemical this is? Celine? Oh, yeah. um, this is melatonin. Um, in the same Richard study, Willie, uh, when, they asked, when they asked residents what uh, supplements do you use to help fall asleep, the absolute most common cited uh, supplement was melatonin. Uh, it makes up 80% of all of, of what residents use to help fall asleep. Uh, does it work for daytime sleep, Willie? Um, so melatonin is a, is a hormone synthesized and released by the pineal gland. Uh, tends to be released at night to remind our bodies it is time to go to sleep. Uh, of note, it does not keep us asleep. It just tells us to go to sleep. That's a half-life of about two hours. Um, so it, no, it does not work once you are asleep. Uh, there is data that shows it has some benefit in jet lag, which is, again, moving a few time zones here and there. Uh, our pineal gland at peak when it releases melatonin, uh, when you measure our blood, is 80 micrograms per ml. This is how, this is our physiological endogenous level. For people who take a 10 milligram of melatonin by mouth, right, you reach peaks of 
5,000 picograms per ml, right? So you would assume any, any amount of exogenous melatonin should have a humongous effect on your sleep if there was one, right? Uh, so there was a Cochrane review that not too long ago, uh, they unfortunately rated the evidence as low quality. And this again, using melatonin for sleeping in the day. Um, but they showed a modest benefit of about 24 minutes increase in sleep duration, uh, melatonin versus placebo. Again, this is, they considered this low quality evidence. Um, but does it work for people in EM? It's actually decently studied. Uh, this was the James study looking at EMS workers working days and nights. Uh, whenever they had a night shift, they took either six milligrams of melatonin or placebo over a string of four nights in a row. They had them record how well did you sleep, how long did you sleep. Uh, no difference when they looked at these, this study. Uh, next, we'll look at the right study. This is looking at um, EM attendings, again, in the academic emergency department. They did uh, three nights in a row, five milligrams of melatonin versus placebo. And then about a month later, they were crossovers. So the other group would have melatonin and the other group would have placebo. They did two things. They did one, subjective sleep testing or, or, or subjective uh, sleep assessment. How well did you sleep? How long did you sleep? Did you wake up in the middle of the night? Um, and there was no difference there. Uh, they also made them perform on their nights. Oh, you can click next. Uh, they also can, made them perform on their nights uh, similar psychological testing, reflex testing on an iPad. And there was also no difference there. So they didn't perform better on their nights. They didn't sleep better in their days, at least not subjectively. Uh, the Jorgensen study, again, these are all done within like 10 years apart from each other, looked at 10 milligrams of uh, melatonin. Again, this is the highest dose of all these studies. Versus placebo on a string of nights, um, they asked them, how well did you sleep? No difference. Did you wake up in the middle of the night? No difference. And then finally, uh, the Djokovic study actually had these EM attendings and residents put on a sleep tracker. So this is objective sleep data one milligram versus placebo. Uh, and they look at the duration of sleep on sleep tracker, the sleep latency, so how long did it take you to fall asleep, and efficiency of all the time you were in bed, how much of that time you were asleep. Um, by sleep tracker, there was no difference. Um, so overall, I think there is maybe modest benefits in the real world, but if you look at specifically EM physicians, EM residents, we have not found a single study that says melatonin helps us sleep better in the daytime. Again, there's plenty of data said to help us sleep better at night, but in the daytime, it is pretty weak evidence. With that said, now there is a new kind of uh, formulation of melatonin, which is extended release melatonin. Um, a lot of sleep experts theorize this is actually gonna be much better for daytime. There is much more limited evidence for this, um, but the idea is that uh, because melatonin goes in and out of your system in two hours, probably not gonna help for your eight hours of sleep, but if you have a constant uh, flow of melatonin in your system, maybe it'll keep us a little bit more sleep. Uh, so yeah. Okay, so you slept, you're 5.3 hours, you wake up, you're groggy, you gotta go to work. Um, what else is gonna help us? Uh, for those of us working in this time of the year where we're waking up and we're not seeing any of the sun, uh, the same light therapy can help us feel a lot more awake early in our days. Um, you can get these apparently on Amazon for like 20 bucks. Uh, and they're light therapy kits. You just stare at them for like 20 minutes. And there is, there is modesty that says this keeps you a little bit more awake and helps shift your sleep back. Uh, you just look silly doing this, but. Um, anyways, you go back to your nights, you do it all over again. And then finally, finally, after your string of hopefully just one to four nights, uh, you're, it is time to exit and go back to the world of the living. Um, how do we do this best? Should you sleep in at all the first day? Should you pull a all dayer? Um, limited data on this. So again, I asked our nocturnists how they do it. Um, most of them recommend sleeping no more than three hours on the last night. Um, and all of our nocturnists actually have regular lives in daytime. By that, I mean they sleep at night and are awake during the day. Um, and so they use that last day as a quick transition to go into um, the daytime. So, uh, so a quick three hour nap, live your day, and then go back to sleeping at night. Um, nights suck. I think there is 
good objective evidence for that if it was not clear to you already. Um, I asked kind of our nocturnists what helped them stay working at nights. Uh, for many of them, it was the people. They felt that their colleagues at night just jived better with them. Um, for a lot of them, they preferred the uh, control of their schedule. Um, two of them actually said it was better for family time because working nights allowed them to have dinner at home with their family while working the four to 12 shift meant they could not have dinner with their family. Um, uh, about half of them said they appreciated um, a little bit more autonomy at night, right? We're not calling primary care docs. We're not being uh, watched by admin as closely. This is, this is a little time to be a little free. And it also allowed them to have a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time with residents. So these were the most uh, cited um, reasons for our nocturnists for staying at night. Um, this is just a reminder uh, that nights are tough. This is me as a PGY2. Uh, this is for some of our younger folks. This is Sumant, who was a PGY3. And Sumant saw me struggling on my fifth, five of five, five, five nights. Uh, there was like 25 on my board. This is team three back in the day. And he said, I will pick up one patient for you, but I will, I will give you a back rub. And so um, be kind to one another on nights. All right, this is the, the one spot everyone's been watching for. For those who took a nap, this is your time to wake up and take a screenshot. Uh, so my evidence-based recommendations for night shifts. If given the option with your scheduler and for finding your next job, try to look for shorter stretches of nights. Please do not work more than four. You will suffer. That is objective. Um, try, if you can, to move in a clockwise rotation from days to evenings to nights. Uh, do a shorter string of nights. Avoid domas. They're not good for us. Uh, try to get anchor sleep. So if you're off the next day, try to sleep in a little bit later so your body can adjust to that nighttime. Um, nap before your shifts because this is great for us. If you're going to drink ca caffeine, that is fine. Please drink it early in a shift so you're not ruining your sleep the next day. Um, skip the brunch. In the daytime, avoid the lights. I've actually started packing sunglasses for my overnight commute. Um, and finally, melatonin, although everyone loves it, in the data, in the EM, it really has almost no benefit. But with that said, it also has a pretty decent side effect profile. So if you're, you, know, you want to take high doses, it tends to be okay. Um, I think, next slide. I think the, the way I look at it is that night shifts are a heavy, heavy burden um, that all of us take in our careers. And at the end of the day, our, the way to balance it is, is with our days, right? The sacrifice we give to make nights bearable is we give up our days. We give up a day before night to adjust, to nap, to reaccumulate our sleep. And we give up days after our nights to sleep more, to recover, to eat, to exercise, to compensate for the time we lost on nights. Um, and so as, as the weights of, of our nights get bigger and bigger in our careers, uh, especially as we age, it's critical that we give ourselves enough room and enough days to kind of balance that, right? At the end of the day, it's about balance. Do you go for the brunch? Do you go for the doma so you have five days off to go travel somewhere? Or are nights so debilitating to you that you need two days off after every night just to recover? Um, that is going to be your choice, uh, but I will hopefully give you the tool.